We're in Romans chapter 13. And we, we kind of bumped into the first three verses last week right at the end of class. But I want to go back and, and just kind of rehash those first three verses. The first seven verses deal primarily with our relationship to government. And that government's authority that's given it by God. Paul starts in verse 1 with let every person. So he, he's telling us in effect that we're all under the authority of the government of the country that we live in. And then Paul clarifies that all that authority has been instituted by God. And it's authorized by God. And Paul says that if we resist or we rebel or we kick back against government, then we're fighting what God has put in place and authorized to do a job. Now, I think, this is I, I think what Paul is trying to teach us is that mankind must have government. And I think God recognized that, that without some form of government in place, it would be absolute chaos. And God has organized a system of government in every country, in every culture, in every nation since the beginning of mankind. Now, we know that God established the governing authority. And I don't even pretend to understand all the aspects of how God works with our government. Now, when we have an election, we should pray that we have enough wisdom to elect people that will keep our country free, that will preserve our rights, and keep us safe. And I think God helps us do that. And I can't explain how that works. I'm not sure anybody can, but certainly not Jimmy. But I believe God has a hand in everything. And I believe as Christians, we ought to be praying for our officials, those that are elected now, and those that seek election, that if chosen, they have enough wisdom, and common sense, we'll say, to lead our country in the right way. And I think that's our responsibility as Christians. In verse 4, Paul says two times that government authorities are servants of God. Servants of God. He says that two times. For our own good. Now, <clears throat> I was in business for myself. Mom and pop, small business. If you have any idea what that's like, if somebody comes in and says, Hi, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you, it's been a very, it's going to be a very bad day. That's not, we don't usually associate something good with government. But scripture says government's there for our own good. Now, I think it's God's ideal that government is good for us. After the fact, 
after that, it's up to the leadership of those governments to fulfill that role. Now, another role that government has in verse 4 is the responsibility to punish wrongdoers. To punish evil, to punish crime. Scripture says to bear the sword. To bear the sword. Now, in the times these words were written, to bear the sword meant death. And a lot of people that, that are real proponents of the death penalty will point to that verse and say that that's authorized by God. And we're not going to talk about all that today. But part of the government's responsibility is to protect right and punish wrong. And that's part of that authorization that God has given them. We have a system in place, a legal system, a court system, and that's part of what that system is set up for, is to punish those wrongdoers. And God has given government the right to do that. And without that, we'd be in a mess. I mean, if we had no civil laws, if we had no civil type of government, we'd have no civilization. I mean, it'd be absolute chaos. It'd be every man for himself. So I think that's, in my mind, that's a big part of what government does. In chapter 12, verse 19, if you back up a little, Paul says, never avenge yourselves. Now we think back in our country, not that many years ago, and we had things like lynch mobs, and vigilantes, and things like that, where people basically took the law into their own hands. And that's not authorized by God. That's a reason God has given us that government is so that we don't feel a need to do those kind of things. And we should never avenge ourselves. We talked about that last week a little bit. But that's not our right. That's not our right. Now in verse 5, Paul says, Therefore one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. We shouldn't keep the law of the land just because we're scared. We should keep the law of the land because God said, I put that government in place and if you love me, you'll keep that law. And that will help keep your conscience clean. As parents, we don't want our kids to obey because they're afraid we'll beat them half to death if they don't. We want them to obey us because they love us and they respect us. And that's what, the way God wants us to behave toward our government. Now, conscience is a weird word, especially in our country today. If we have a guilty conscience, most likely we're guilty. If your conscience is saying, I'm hurting, then most likely you are guilty. You are feeling guilty. Webster says it's a sense of right and wrong with the desire to do right. Now the problem with that definition in our society today is who determines what's right and wrong? Where does the truth come from? 
ultimately from God and God's Word. But conscience does play a role in how we behave. Now, conscience doesn't make us do the right thing, always. But what conscience will do is it'll tell you when you did the wrong thing. It'll give you an indication that may not have been the best thing to do. It should create a feeling of guilt and a feeling of sorrow. We hear people say things like, it's eating me alive. Or, I just can't get it off my mind. And in a lot of cases, when we hear those two phrases, there's something bothering their conscience. Something has got a hold of them, and they can't shake it. Now, it's real important to remember that our conscience, like our hands, can become calloused. Now, Taylor says I have girl hands now that I don't work every day. But I used to have hands that I could pick up just about anything hot and it didn't bother me. From dealing with so many exhaust pipes and dealing with hot motors. Now that's not the case. Waitresses used to hand me a plate and say, be careful, it's hot. And I'm like, no, it ain't. Now when they hand me a plate and say it's hot, it's like, whoa, that's hot. And our conscience can do that same thing. If we just let it go, it'll build up a resistance and it'll get seared and it'll get calloused. And then we don't feel that guilt like we did to first time. I watched an interview that James Dobson did years ago with Ted Bundy the night before he was executed. It was eerie. He said when he killed that first girl, it took him about two and a half, three weeks before he could even hardly eat because it bothered him so bad. But by the time they caught him, he said, I could have killed somebody every hour. And it just didn't bother me. I had no feeling. And that's the way our conscience can become. In John 8, we have a story of a woman caught in adultery, surrounded by men with stones, right? And Jesus says, He who is without sin among you, throw the first stone. Now we're all familiar with that. Got the woman, got the circle of men, everybody's got a rock. And Jesus says, if you got no sin, you throw the first rock. In the NIV, not the NIV, the King James and the New King James, verse 9 says, Then those who heard it, those words, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest to the last. Those men's conscience told them, you have no right to throw that stone. And they got up and they walked out. Other translations leave out that sentence being convicted by their conscience. I really like that in there. Because I think that's what our conscience does. It convicts us. It's real interesting. Later in John 8 verse 32 it says, The truth will set you free. If you want a clean conscience, a clear conscience, tell the truth. And those men knew that they truly had no right to throw a stone. Now, in verse 6, Paul says, 
Because of this. Because of this. Now he's referring to keeping your conscience clean. He tells us to, oh, we're going to get personal here. We got to pay our taxes. Wow, that's a bummer. We might not like it. We might not think it's fair. We might not like what they're doing with that tax money. But guess what? If you don't pay, old Ron's going to come get you. <laughs> it's our duty as Christians to pay our taxes. Taxes are necessary. Without our tax system in place, we'd have no military. We might not have as much law enforcement. We'd have hardly any infrastructure. The education system would be worse than it is. The court systems are backed up bad enough, but without tax money, it'd be awful. And now you couldn't even mail a letter. As Christians, we have a responsibility to pay our taxes. We have that responsibility. Remember one of the Pharisees' tricks, test, so to speak, with Jesus? And they said, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Remember what Jesus said. <coughs> Render unto Caesar's, what is Caesar's, and render unto what is God's. Now that's how Jesus feels about taxes. Now, verse 7 begins, if I can find it, pay to all what is owed to them. Now, he's not speaking about just money. Because he goes on and he talks about respect and honor to who it's owed. One problem we have in this country is a lack of respect for authority. A lack of respect for people in authority. I mean, that, that is a, that's a huge problem. You talk to any law enforcement officer. You talk to any school teacher. That's a problem. A respect for authority. Now, it's a problem with kids. But guess what? It's a problem with adults, too. A big problem. Super big problem. Paul tells us, as a Christian, it's our responsibility to pay respect to who it's owed and honor to who it's owed. We ought to be an example, a good example, a godly example. And if we're not, we need to work on that. We need to be an example. Verse 8. If my voice will let me, I'm going to read 8, 9, and 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the, love, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the, commandment, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now that set of verses is speaking about brotherly love. Brotherly love. And that brotherly love, Paul says, is a way for us to fulfill the law. Now, 
that beginning part of verse 8 is not telling us that we have to pay cash for everything. But if you owe a debt, pay the debt. Pay the debt. The only outstanding debt we should have as Christians is the debt we owe to God to love each other. To love each other. And we'll never be able to repay that debt. And I'm not real sure about it. But based on Paul's earlier words about loving your enemies, I think we might get a little extra credit if we love them too. Now, in 1 John 4.11 it says, Beloved, that's us, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. That's a debt that we owe to God. We owe it to God to love each other. Is that easy sometimes? No. Most of what God has told us to do and Jesus has lived out is hard. It's counter to our nature. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. In verse 9, Paul is saying that the commandments are summed up by the words, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Obeying those commandments that's listed right there would be no problem if we truly loved each other as ourself. If we had true love in our heart for each other, we could not commit those sins. I think that's what Paul's trying to say. Now, I said last week that Jesus didn't set the bar, that Jesus is the bar. And that bar is set really high. And we'll probably never get to that height. I don't think we can. But that's our goal. That's our goal. You picture an Olympic pole vaulter trying to get over a new height. And they try and they try and they try and they try and then finally one day they get over there. What do they do the next day? What do they do with the bar the next day? They raise it up. That's the way we are to be. We are to be raising that bar every day. And that's a challenge, but that's what life is. Now in verse 10, Paul has more to say about love. Love doesn't do wrong to anyone. That goes back to that thing about don't avenge yourself. Love should do no wrong to anyone. And I think Paul's trying to say that if we can live like that, then we can fulfill God's law. We can keep God's commands. Now, we're not going to keep them perfectly, and he knows that. But if we have that kind of love in our heart, we'll do a really good job. And if we get that right... You, you know, the, in Matthew 22, we have the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, on those two commands hang the whole law. On those two commands. Love God and love each other. <clears throat> 
Now, in verse 11 through 14. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now, in verse 12, uh, chapter 12, chapter 13, and most of chapter 14, Paul is talking about how to live as a Christian. What that should look like. And these last few sentences, Paul is telling them, and as a byproduct, he's telling us as well, to wake up. To wake up and live in faith while we wait for Jesus' return. Verse 11 in the ESV begins with, besides this. In the NIV and New King James and a couple others it says, and do this. I'd probably say, on top of everything I've already said, wake up. It's time to wake up. Pay attention to what I've said and wake up. And Now Paul may have thought that they were wondering why. They needed to do all this stuff. Why is all this so important? Why must we obey our government? Why must we love our enemies? Why do I have to like him? He don't even like me. Why do I have to respect others? And who gave him the authority? And they probably were asking those questions because we ask them sometimes. Paul's purposes in these last few verses of this chapter are to answer those questions. Why? Now, back in chapter 12, we had some fun with do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Now that's a whole lot easier to read and to say those words than it is to do what it says. That's a real challenge. But Paul is serious and he's telling us that now is the time to live appropriately because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Now, in those few verses, Paul makes three references to time. And the first reference is, the hour has come for you to wake up. The hour has come for you to wake up. Now, picture in your mind, I'm sure most of all you've been here, you go to your kid's room for the third time to get them out of bed in the morning, do you just lean down and go, it's time to wake up, sweetie? Or do you blow your top and say, get out of that bed? I think Paul is saying right here, hey, I've been telling you, wake up, wake up, wake up. Now's the time I'm fixing to get real. Wake up. Now in my mind, that's what Paul is telling these people, is we've been messing around, you've been hitting the snooze over and over, but it's time to get up. His second reference to time says, For salvation is nearer to us now 
than when we first believed. Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Here's a fact for you. We're one day closer to eternity than we were yesterday. We're one day closer to eternity than we were yesterday. Now, salvation is a term that can refer to our past, our conversion, our baptism. It can refer to our present, being justified. And it can re refer to our future salvation. And I think that's what Paul is pointing to here. Our future salvation. And our, as one of the commentators put it, our final salvation. <clears throat> we have an inheritance waiting on this. It's called a future glory. We can't even picture what that looks like. But it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. And that's one day closer than it was yesterday. And tomorrow to be one day closer than it is today. And that's a reality. We don't like thinking about that sometimes, but that's a reality. And sometimes all it takes is the sudden death of somebody to really drive that home. Alma's funeral yesterday. Nobody expected her at 43 to be dead, leave those two children and Gary without her for the rest of their lives. We're not promised tomorrow. And Paul's telling these people in this book, in this letter, hey, wake up. Live right. Because the hour is coming. After 9-11, I used this reference in class one time with the teenagers, and they're like, what's 9-11? But anyway, everybody in here knows what it is. After 9-11, our country was shook. For many reasons. One was we were attacked on our own turf. And that shook us. But the really, really shaking part was all those families who lost loved ones that day that fully expected that morning when they left and went their separate ways that that evening they'd all be back together. And then they weren't. And that shook, our, that shook our country. It's like, that was like a, a wake up. But what happened? Over a period of six or eight or ten months, everybody just back, went back to status quo. For the first few months, church buildings were full of people. And then just gradually, just... And that's the way humans are. And Paul's telling these people, hey, wake up. Wake up. Paul's third reference to time is in verse 12. The night, the darkness, is far gone. The day, Christ's return, is at hand. Now in Matthew 25, we have a story about the ten virgins. Remember the story? They're waiting on the bridegroom. And he's delayed. All of a sudden, boom, he gets there at midnight, which was totally unexpected. Five of those virgins were ready, and five were not. They were called foolish. Matthew 25, 13, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And then earlier in Matthew, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. That's the message Paul is trying to teach 
these Roman people. Live as if he's coming right now. Live your lives so that you're ready. Now, today, it's been 2,000 years almost since Paul wrote those words. And those people were anxious for Jesus to come. Wondering, hey, is he coming back? And now we're 2,000 years later almost. And we're still wondering, hey, are you coming back? You said you was coming back soon. We forget the words of 2 Peter 3.8. It says, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. So keep in your mind, it's only been a couple of days. Right? The last part of verse 12 begins with, So then, in the ESV, in the New King James, it says, Therefore. Now these words make a transition from Paul's statements about time to his commands about living properly. So he's saying it's time to do this, and this is what you need to do. Now, he refers to sinful actions as deeds of darkness or works of darkness in most translations. Now, always in Scripture, always, at least I think I'm safe in saying always. That's a dangerous word, but always that I'm aware of, sin is related to darkness. And Paul is writing, keep in mind, Paul is writing to people like us in a church, calling themselves Christians. And he's telling them, and by proxy us, to cast off our sinful actions. Now we're all sinners. We all fall short and we recognize that. But Paul is saying, cast off our sinful actions and put on the armor of light. The, one of the commentators that I'm reading uh, says the Greek word for that means weapons of war. Put on your weapons for war. Be ready to fight. Be ready to fight. Paul in Timothy says, fight the good fight of faith. Now, Paul tells us in verse 13 that now that we're awake, now that he's woke us up, and we're dressed properly for a fight, we are to live lives that will glorify our God and our Savior. That's why we're here. We're supposed to live lives that glorify God. That's our purpose. Verse 13 begins with let us walk properly. And walk is a way of saying live in Scripture. As in the daytime. He's saying we ought to be unashamed of the way we live. Our life should be open book. We are to be seen for who we really are. That's, that's scary. That's, that's kind of scary. Ultimately, we're not supposed to be a hypocrite. Paul then gives us a list of sin of six sinful actions, deeds of darkness. And that's far from a complete list of sin. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Paul may have mentioned just those six because he's writing, to, he's writing a letter to a specific church family. And he may have had some insight that this is the stuff they're dealing with. 
And that's why I'm going to mention these six. Especially those last two. Those last two, quarreling and jealousy, because that's what he's going to talk about in the next part of his letter. And that is a big problem today. Now, verse 14, Paul's telling us how to avoid these deeds of darkness. He gives us two commands, one positive and one negative. He tells us to put on Christ. Put on Christ. So what does that mean? For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Paul's telling these people, if you're not a Christian, that's step one. Put on Christ. Putting on Christ is not a one and done thing. Not something you just do one time and your ticket's punched and then you just live your life ever how you want to. Putting on Christ is a lifetime obligation. It's a lifetime commitment and it's a lifetime journey. It means taking on the characteristics of Jesus like compassion and kindness and humility and patience and this, this putting on Jesus or putting on Christ is in, in a sense like a suit of armor, a, a protection. And I, I think that's what Paul is saying. Use that to arm yourself against all this darkness and this sinful nature. And then Paul's second command is make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I like the New King James says, to fulfill its lust. So what does it mean to make no provisions for? The original Greek word combines before and think. And they came up with the word forethought. Give some thought. And an example I'll throw out, if you're a recovering alcoholic, and you keep a bottle hid in your house, then you're making provision for sin. If you surround yourself with people doing sinful things, you're making provision for sin. If you're somewhere you shouldn't be, at a time you shouldn't be, and you realize that, you're making provision provision for sin. We need to recognize our weaknesses. We all have them. And realize that Satan knows them. He's, Satan's not going to tempt me with alcohol because that's never been a temptation for me. But Satan tempts me in a lot of other ways that really are. We need to put up our defense. We need to be aware of situations and people that we need to avoid. Because Satan does not need our help. We can get in enough trouble of our own without helping Satan. Next week... Uh, we'll try to get through about half of chapter 14. So if you want to be reading ahead, uh, dealing a lot with, uh, we'll say, infighting in the church. But that's going to be a real comfortable lesson too. Thank you all.